Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. I mean, I was just so excited when I came in and the very first song that was on is See What the Lord Has Done. Apart from the fact that I really liked that song, I was delighted because of the fact that I know that heaven orchestrates things like that every now and again just to give us an encouragement, to let us know. Because as I was getting ready for this meeting, one of the things that the Lord put on my heart that came to me as an express word was to focus on what God himself is looking at and looking for. You see, we are not more clever than the one who made the system. Neither are we holier than the one who is holy, holy, holy. You know, but every now and again, we live our lives as though we are better than God. We live our lives as though we can do better than God. And I'll give you an example and then we'll, we'll get right into it. You know, when you look at the things that God himself does, you see, God forgives us because we are too sinful for him not to forgive us. <laughs> the Bible says God came to a conclusion very early on in the game. He says, my spirit will not continue to contend with man because he is indeed flesh and the thoughts of his heart are evil continually. And so God chose to forgive. But we choose to keep grudge. I mean, you don't get it. God chooses to forgive because it's like, how much grudge do you want to hold? These people? It's better you choose to love than to hate. God has chosen such a position as an example unto us because he knew what he made. He knew the earth that he came to, the state that it was in, and the state that it will remain in until a new one comes to take its place. Do you not know or have you not read in scripture wherein the Bible says that the eye of the Lord runs to and fro upon the earth seeking for the man whose mind he stayed on him. But you are busy looking for people who are doing wrong so that you can judge them. And God is like, I'm not even looking for bad people. I'm looking for only the good ones. God is looking to find good in the midst of the chaos. Let me remind you, we live in a world that is the lowest realm of existence. Someone says, oh, what about Hades? Well, when Jesus died and he went down deep down to hell, what did he do? He shut down the place. The Bible says he led captivity itself captive and he set the captives free. And so since that realm was shut down, we became the new bottom of existence. This realm that we're in is the lowest of the lows and God is interested in this realm because he knows there is still good in here. Let us go to the book of Genesis. Oh, I like that scripture. Oh yes, he says when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. He shut down the shale that is beneath us. And someone says, hmm, if Jesus shut down Sheol, so what, what is this thing about the lake of fire? Sheol is not the lake of fire. The lake of fire is a different machine that has been prepared and it sits at the edge of the universe. When Enoch saw the lake of fire, they told him, they said, of all men, you alone have come this close to the end of all things that are. Beyond the lake of fire, what you see is nothing. They, show, they showed him the edge of existence. And that was where the lake of fire was. And it is reserved for the stars that could not find it within themselves to comply with the word of God. The Bible says that the lake of fire is reserved for the deceiver and his false prophet and the beast. Because there they will remain. Because they are eternal beings, they have to be put somewhere. And also in that lake of fire, 
Also in that place where the worms do not die, the souls of the unbelievers will be destroyed. That is the gospel. That is why it's called the good news. Not what we were told when we were growing up, that unbelievers, were gonna, they're going to be tortured forever. Ask the next person who tells you that where it is in the Bible. The Bible says that Jesus himself speaking. He says, do not be afraid of the one that can destroy the body. He said, but be afraid of the one that can annihilate the soul and the body in hell. That lake of fire is for destroying souls that did not choose eternity. Jesus is eternity. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Choose me so that you can live forever. So if you don't choose me, what happens? You don't live forever. You get destroyed. You get annihilated. You get removed. And that is what is even more of a good news and more of an incentive for people to be saved than to say that they're going to be punished. If you keep preaching punishment, you're breeding resentment when Jesus says to go and tell them of the good news. The good news is if you choose him, you have life eternal. Jesus says in John 3, 16, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes will not perish but have life eternal. The word perish means to perish. It may sound like punish, but it is not punish, it is perish. Perish means to cease to exist. <laughs> Someone says, but if you preach that, people will continue living in sin because then they're just going to come to this conclusion that it doesn't matter. You know, I can just do whatever I want and then at the end of the day, I'm going to be destroyed in hell. Well, to be destroyed in hell, I don't know if it takes two minutes or if it takes two years. So if you want to find out, be my guest. Sorry, don't be my guest because I'm not going to be there. Knock yourself out. Okay? Knock yourself out. You understand what I mean? But one thing that I do know is you need or we need to promote eternal life. The incentive for choosing to believe in God should not be the fear of eternal damnation. It should be the joy of life with him everlasting. Because I don't want someone to be with me because they're afraid of being outside. That means you really wouldn't be with me if you had a choice. And God wants us to choose him. You understand what I mean? We need to choose him. The Bible says whosoever must come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him, not a punisher of those who reject him. You come to him with the intention of knowing that or with the notion of knowing that he rewards those who seek him, not those who reject him. If our gospel has not been effective, it is not the fault of the unbeliever. It is the ignorance of the ones who are meant to be preaching the gospel. We need to repent from dead works. You know, even John the Baptist, who was not the nicest fellow, when he came, he wasn't preaching damnation. He was saying, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. He was telling them that the kingdom had come. And what is the kingdom? Righteousness, peace, and joy. He was telling them that you no longer have to break a sweat for your own righteousness because it will be by the blood of the Lamb. He was telling them that their righteousness would be a gift. He was telling them that their peace will be ordained by the hand of God and determined by the grace of Christ. He was telling them that the kingdom had come. He wasn't saying repent because the fire is burning brighter. And today we came in here and the band started to sing, see what the Lord has done. Let us go to the book of Genesis chapter 1. And we will read from verse 18. In fact, I'm going to read a couple of verses actually. Let's first of all read verse 4. The Bible says in verse 4, for Ade's sake, I'm going to read from verse 1. Because I don't think Ade's ever heard me read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Yeah, yeah, because it doesn't happen that I would just go to 18. What about verse 1? 2, 3, and 4. Some of my favorites of all times. Um, for anybody who is looking for a fun exercise... Read Genesis chapter 1 and John chapter 1 and you will see how similar they are. 1 to 4 is almost the same. Verse 12 of, of John chapter 1 says, For as many as have received him, to them have we given the power to become 
the sons of God. When you read verse 12 of Genesis chapter 1, he says something very similar. The Bible says, and the earth brought forth grass and herb and, and yields, seed according to its kind. So it's already been ordained for us to be brought forth according to the kind of the wheat, that grain of wheat that refused to remain alone. Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. Anyway, verse 4, actually verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God saw the light was good before he separated the light from the darkness. The Lord said to me concerning this meeting and beyond that as the ecclesia, we need to be able to see what he sees. And let me tell you one of the things that the Lord deal with, did with me as he was dealing with me today. He knew that a part of me was still resisting what he was presenting to me. The conversations were ongoing. The fellowship was sweet, but the surrender was not complete because God was showing me certain things about me, about others. And I was like, okay, I get it, but then at the same time, I'm not sure I get it. And then as soon as I came down from the car to flush open the door into the building, the Lord gave me help. I said with my mouth, let me see what you see. And the resistance just broke. You know, because sometimes we know what we suspect. And we are focused on seeing our suspicion Confirmed. You know, when you think about somebody, you're suspecting that. I think that person is going to cheat me in this business. I just, I just have that feeling. And every notion of yours, now, or every action of yours, now becomes so focused on confirming your notion. You know, there are certain times when your spouse will do a thing and you will convince yourself they did it so that they can hurt your feelings. And then you'll be looking for every way of confirming that that was why they did it. In fact, you start asking stupid questions. Did you really do that because? When the Bible says, think evil of no one. You see what I mean? We, we always think the worst of people. You understand what I mean? We always do. Forgetting the fact that when God made the heavens and the earth, after he said, let there be light, light and darkness were existing together and God chose to focus on the light, not on the darkness. You ask someone to come and help you move and after two minutes, they sit down and they're scrolling on their phone. <laughs> their spirit is willing because the other people told you excuses. That other person said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to be out of town. But the reality of it is, can I tell you a story? One day we invited a couple to a meeting and they told us that they were going to be out of town and God showed me where they were. And I said, but God, they're still here. He said, yes. But to them, because they have left Swanee and gone to Buford, they have left town. True story. Oh, yes. So when they said, oh, we're sorry, we're out of town, they, were fit, they convinced themselves they were not lying. Because they left one town and went to the other. But the Lord took me to the place where they were. And after a while, they posted a picture that they took. And the Lord said to me, can you see? I said, this was what I saw. He said, yeah, they took that picture the same day. But now they're just posting it. It's letter Graham. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Yeah. Because the reality of it is that People who are not willing will find a way because creativity is a gift that God gave to us by virtue of our makeup. He made us in his image and in his likeness. So when people are not willing to do stuff, they get creative. They make up all kinds of excuses. 
The same way the willing ones get creative and find a way to help even when their arms are weak. So that other fellow is one whose spirit is willing because at least he or she came to help. They're willing, but the flesh is weak. Do you know that that person may not even know that they have gotten carried away and reverted back to their lazy self that just wants to keep scrolling and all you have to do is just focus on the fact that they were willing enough to have left all to come to you instead of saying, oh, if you, don't want, if you didn't want to help, you should have stayed at home. Isn't that what we say to people like that instead of saying, well, I, I hope you're not tired already. Why don't you just uh, put that phone aside for a minute and help me with this box? And when you say things like that, people are always like, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's what I should do. Because some people truly, and the reality of it is that even when we are shining the lights, trying to help people, the flesh represents darkness and it brings that darkness all the time. It is now left to you to choose whether to see the light or to see the darkness. There are times where my wife is willing and, 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 and helping me do stuff, but the darkness of my yuck mouth will say things my wife used to struggle with it. And she would say to me, do you not know that I'm doing this to help you and you're saying that? And I would say to her, I just did that to get it out. Yeah, someone who was trying to help me. You know, she may be trying to help me put, put things away. And I'm like, wow, your stacking skills need help. So you think that should go in there? And my wife would be like, you know what? Maybe you just need to come and do it yourself if you're going to keep running your mouth. But then after a while, she got to realize that, you know what? I just need to focus on the light. <laughs> because there is enough darkness to see in this fellow. If I choose to look at the darkness, I will stumble. Jesus says those who walk in the night will stumble. For there are 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. There's always as much darkness as there is light. The choice is yours. What are you going to focus on? You want to focus on the darkness of the weakness of that person's flesh or do you want to focus on the goodness of their heart by God? If we are going to move to this next level with the captain of our salvation, we need to repent from dead works and begin to see as he sees. There was darkness, but the Bible says, and God saw the light. If that was you and I right next to God while he was creating we would tap his shoulder and say, God, what about the darkness? You, you, you're missing the darkness. He already saw the darkness. That was why he said, let there be light. And why would you focus on what you're trying to get rid of? Because what you focus on is what you magnify. If I want to take a picture of Anita right now, I'm not going to focus on the chair next to her because then that's going to fill the entire screen. But that's what we do. We focus on the evil that God has already identified in people when he sent Jesus to die for them. He knew how much help we all need. Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave Jesus to us so that we can have some light to be seen. Let's go to verse 18. Verse 4 again, the Bible says, God saw that the light was good. Let's jump to verse 18 because of time and just to break away from tradition. Actually, let's start reading from verse 17. The Bible says, and God said, God said, God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. Verse 16 says, God made two great lights. Can we say that God made two great lights? The Bible did not say God made one light and then he made another rock to reflect that light. It, did he run out of light? No, he didn't. He made two great lights. In the 50s, some people came out and told us that the moon is light, that it is plasma. They disappeared from the face of the academia. Because how dare you be a professor in the academia and agree with scriptures. How dare you? But we are back. They can't get rid of us. You can try to eliminate us once again. We will keep coming back until we are done. Because we are of the light and we are inextinguishable. We cannot be done away with. 
Oh, yes. And that is the reason why every true witness of the truth is never afraid to die. Because like Paul said, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. Because if they eliminate me before I am done, I gain an opportunity to show up again and say, hey, I'm back. Hasta la vista, my friends. They've eliminated a lot of people who try to tell us that the moon itself is light. But now, in fact, when the, when the number of people saying it on TikTok grew, they wanted to shut TikTok down. Because the people saying it on Instagram, they found a way of, 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 of locking them much, much easier than the ones saying it on TikTok. So just so you know, the moon is not like that song that they used to sing at the church down the road, who made the moon reflect the sun. I don't even know that song because I deleted it from my memory. Because we used to sing that song while we are in worship, like, oh, the moon reflects the light of the sun. And God is like, uh, next church, please. This one's not ready yet. They be singing NASA, not scripture. Anyway, the Bible says God made two great lights. The greater light to rule in the day. And for the people who are hearing this for the first time and your, and your mind is getting stuck on it, let me just explain to you the physics behind what I've just said. You see, the light of the sun is a different color to the light of the moon. And you cannot change the color of light by reflection. It doesn't happen. That physics is not, is not physics in you understand what I mean? That physics is not physics in. You cannot change the color of light. You understand what I mean? No matter how powerful the mirror is, I cannot stand in front of it and start to look like Brad Pitt. I will still be as dark as I am, regardless of how bright the mirror is. You understand what I mean? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I know, you know, me and Brad, we kind of look alike, just a different complexion. But that will remain so until Jesus comes. That complexion will be different because light reflected does not change the hue. The hue remains the same. And the other thing is when you reflect any energy source, it maintains its properties. So when you reflect a light source that is hot, it doesn't suddenly become cold. Because that heat also radiates with the transmission of light. Can I prove that to you? Remember when we were little children, and we would take little magnifying glasses and use them to burn paper. Because when you put it out in the sun at night, you concentrate that heat of the sun to a small area and then it burns. So light reflected or condensed cannot change color, neither does it change the heat properties. In fact, if anything at all, you can only magnify it, you cannot diminish it. How come the light of the moon is cold? Do you know that at night, if you bring out a sheet of aluminum and you put it out at night and part of it is in the shade of a tree and the other part is in the light of the moon, the part that is in the light of the moon begins to cool down faster than the one that is in the shade of the tree. That is physics. And the, and the forces that tell us otherwise, we know where they're from and we know who their father is. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil, the father of lies. You see, we're not afraid simply because this is not the first time that we're trying to open the eyes of the blind. And David says something. He says, I will not die, but live to declare your works. So when they kill the body, we haven't died because we're not done. We keep coming back. I'll be back. I am here to do the work of him who has sent me while it is day. And so two great lights to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. Now verse 18, and to rule over the day and over the night. Let me interest you in, a, in some more physics, since today sounds like a physics kind of day. You know, the Bible did not say that the sun, but the Bible says the sun rules in the day. To rule is not to be the one doing the work. <laughs> you see, when you're ruling, you're not the worker. You're the commander 
of the ones actually doing the work. And so when God says the sun should rule in the day, it makes sense to me because God already made the day before he made the sun. So the sun is not the reason why you have day and night. Because the Bible says the evening and the morning were the first day and the sun was not even made until what? The, the fourth day? Because God already says, let there be light. So the sun is not what gives you light. God made light. The sun is just an energy field that has the ability to concentrate light. So it rules in the day because the moment it rises, light gathers around its influence. And that is why it's called a light bearer, not a light giver. There is only one that can give light, and he is called the father of light. But there is, you can be a light bearer. You can be one who brings light, but you're not the one giving it. You're not the source of it. You are just a commander of it because God gives you authority over light. If you want to experiment with what I'm telling you at home, find yourself a fluorescent tube, a tube Preferably a glass tube that is filled with some kind of gas that is luminous, maybe like a neon gas. And then connect some electricity through it. And once you run electricity through a fluorescent tube that contains some neon or any kind of argon, I think, or whatever they call those gases, what happens is the gases receive more energy than they need, and so they begin to emit light as a result of being energized. So that is how you can produce light without the sun. We do that all the time, right? We, we have these fluorescent tubes and LED lamps, and they produce light just from gases. Now create an electromagnetic field around this fluorescent tube. Now, if you have neon, or, or if, you, so if you take a typical fluorescent tube, what is the color of the light? It's usually white because it's just pure light. It's white. Then when you take an electromagnetic field and you run it around it, the light then starts to become yellow. In fact, it begins by being orange around the closest part of it to the field, and then it becomes yellow, and then it becomes blue. Just like what you see when the sun is rising in the morning. You see that light going from orange to yellow, and then it becomes blue light, right? That is what is happening in the sky. You can experiment it on your desk. Because God made everything so that you can validate all of what he made. The Bible says from the visible elements of this world, we have an understanding of the invisible attributes of God and of eternity. Solomon says he gave us eyes that we may see, tongues that we may taste. Why? Because he wants us to be able to enjoy and validate the things that he created. And so if anybody says to you, just believe the math and the physics, tell them, uh, that's not how it works. I have to be able to replicate it. If I can't replicate it, then it's not true. Yeah, if I can't replicate it, it is not true. You know, because the last time the academia tried to perform an experiment to prove that the earth was spinning was in the late 1800s. And that was because they came to a conclusion that it is what the Bible says. It is set upon foundations that cannot be moved. But people just want you to believe what they say. Anyway, I'm like, no, but why can't we experiment to prove what you're saying? And they're like, oh, there's no way to experiment. Okay, then that means you're just telling me to believe it just because you say it. No, no, and God doesn't want me to just believe something because somebody says it. The Bible says, let each one of them be fully persuaded within themselves. Without signs and wonders, they will not believe. I'm not just going to believe what you say, especially if it's contrary to what God says. Romans chapter 3 verse 4 says, let God be true and every man a liar. You see, I went over those things because I am being reminded today that if we are truly going to see the word of God work for us, we have to believe the word of God 100. You cannot pick and choose. You can't skip over verse 16 that tells you that the moon is light. And then you want to believe verse 18. Because verse 18 is where the power is. But you have to have connected from verse 16. Otherwise, the power doesn't work for you. It's just like there is power in the wall and I want to charge my phone, but I don't want to plug into the wall and I just have this cable dangling under my phone. That phone will die. 
guaranteed because it's not plugged in. So we need to be plugged into the truth and let the devil be ashamed. You know one of the reasons why I'm excited to, to be led this way by the Holy Spirit again today? As I was driving here tonight, I remembered someone, or not even someone, a group of business people that I had partnered with who got rid of me in the partnership simply because I told them the truth about the cult that they are bowing down to, and they got rid of me. And for some reason, I just remembered today. And the way the thought came, it came as a way of reminding me of my loss. Like, man, those guys, I, I could have made this kind of money, I could have done this, I could have done that, were it not for what they did. And suddenly, I just remembered that, wait a minute, but why did they do what they did? They did it because I stood for the truth and I was not afraid to tell them that they were of their father, the devil, calling them to repentance. And guess what? I'm like, you know what? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? You know what? They can kick me out of all their boardrooms. As long as they cannot kick me out of the kingdom, I am good. You know, I keep telling you the example of the guys who told me that I can no longer be on their radio station, that I couldn't speak on their radio station because I believe that the moon is light, because I believe that Genesis is actually a true account instead of a myth. And the person who was telling me that was a pastor of about six or seven churches in town. And he was telling me that I couldn't. And I'm like, uh, but I have been called by God to preach Christ crucified. If I am going to preach the truth of the word of God, I have to preach the truth of the word of God unapologetically. And it was like, I have said what I have said. If that is your position, there's no room for you in here. And then as I walked out, the Lord reminded me of what Solomon said. He says, do not hurry out of the presence of the Lord. Why stand in an evil place? So basically, if I choose to stand in the, com in the company of those people who deny the cross, I am in an evil place. I'm like... You can keep that radio station. I will keep the banner of righteousness flying. And when the Son of Man comes in the blue sky, show him your radio station. <laughs> and let's see what you get. I will show him the scars that I sustained from people like you simply because I decided not to let go of the truth. You see, if there's one thing that I am thankful to God for, is the grace that he has given to me to be unashamedly committed to the truth, even when it isn't popular. Simply because, hallelujah, I will be celebrated one day. And the celebration that I long for is a one-man celebration. The Lord Jesus, I just want him to celebrate me. I want him to say, come into the rest of your master, you good and faithful servant. That's all. It doesn't matter if the whole world celebrates you. If Jesus doesn't celebrate you, what is your game? So be encouraged today that this unpopular truth of the word of God will be that which you stay committed to. And I know that we are up against such opposition. But one thing that I do know is that as big as the opposition is, I am not a grasshopper in their sight. I am able to finish my assignment. The reason why many of us are quiet and about the truth that we know is because we feel like we're grasshopper in their sights and that they will crush us. But have you forgotten that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world? I have on several occasions dared principalities and powers simply because it's either I believe that I am in Christ or I'm not. The Bible says Christ is the head of principalities and powers. I have dared principalities and powers and said to them, Hear me, O spirits of darkness, so that you may know where I stand. Simply because I am not afraid of what they might be able to withhold from me because I already know that God did not withhold Jesus from me. You see, it doesn't take much 
to wield the power that is in you. It just takes boldness by the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus gave his disciples power. He says, I've given you power over the scorpion, over the serpent. I've given you power over poison. If you by any means eat poison, it will not hurt you. He gave them power, but he told them that they needed to wait for the Holy Spirit before they started moving in that power. Because when the Holy Spirit came, he gave them boldness. So if we are bold as we should in the Holy Ghost, we will begin to see the power of God at work in us enough to defy 500-year-old establishments of Satan. Even the 5,000-year kingdom of Nimrod is nothing when it comes to the power that is in the name of the Lamb of God. We need to begin to see ourselves for who we are in him, not who we are in the world. In the world, we're slaves. Because this world system is called Egypt. And so if you are not one of the ones being used by Satan to oppress everybody else, then you are the one that is being oppressed. The Bible says that we are killed all day and we are accounted as sheep being led to the slaughter. But that is who we are in the world and it's okay. In Christ Jesus, we are more than conquerors. And we just need to remind ourselves of that because if we only stay conscious in the world dimension, we will continue to feel like we are little. But if we would allow ourselves to wake up into kingdom consciousness, then you will begin to recognize that all of those people who are tormenting you in the world, they have already been brought to subjection and they are at the foot of the Lord Jesus Christ and you are the apple of his eyes. And you are the one that he uses to actually shine the light of victory and dominion over the ones that have been brought to subjection. We need to wake up and recognize who we are so that we are no longer afraid to speak, speak, to live, and to do the work of him who has sent us. Praise the Lord. So look at verse 18. It says, to rule over the, and to rule over the day and over the night. And let's read verse 17 again. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. I just wanted you to see what I said. I said you are the apple of God's eyes, right? You are up here, and you are the light that beams over the ones that have already been brought to subjection. What does that mean? You are in heaven. You are in the firmament, giving light upon the earth. Why should you then be afraid of the ones who are beneath you? I can answer the question for you because I know the answer. The reason why we're afraid is because we're multidimensional beings. We are light in the firmament, but we are also dust in the ground. And many of us are only conscious of the dust side of us, and that's why we feel like Satan can oppress us all the time. Because you only see your, your dust self. You don't see your light self. And the Bible says you need to be conscious more of your light self. Let your attention be on things above and not on things beneath Beneath, what are the things above? There is an instance of you that is above in Christ Jesus. Focus on that one, not on this one that is beneath. That one is light, this one is darkness. Verse 18, oh, verse 17 again. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. What does it mean to give light? Let me help you by introducing an expression. Give light, give attention to light. Give credence to light. I am very much aware of what's going on in here. The spirit of fear is being exposed. You see, because many of us are so afraid of the masters, we're afraid of the lords of the land. And we're, and we're not even aware of it until somebody begins to expose that to you and that's when you feel the fear. And it's very palpable from where I stand. I can feel it. I can see it. But that is my mission in this place to extract that which is within, let it be seen for what it is so that you can deny it and embrace the truth. You need to deny 
Not to deny that you're afraid, but you need to look at the fear and deny that fear access to you going forward. And say, you know what? It doesn't matter what anybody says anywhere else. As long as it's against the word of God, I deny them. I speak the truth. If they ask me to go home, I will not be the first. I have been asked to go home several times. But if I went back to every one of those places, I will go home again. Simply because... The Bible says the companionship of fools shall be destroyed. I would rather be sent home than be found in the company of the unrighteous when the great day of the Lord comes. <laughs> May the Lord help us. In fact, he's helping us. And God's, oh, hallelujah. Verse 18, and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. I come to you today with help from above. To establish in our hearts through the ministry of remembrance that we are made in the image and in the likeness of God and that as dear children we are being commended to the grace of God to be like the one who himself is Lord. We are supposed to be like Jesus. We are supposed to be like our Heavenly Father. And that is exactly what he does. He, he portrays himself again and again as an example for us to follow. And that is the reason why I made this statement years ago and some people stopped talking to me and I'm going to make it again but I know you will keep talking to me because you are of God. Oh yeah, because the Holy Spirit told me that when I'm making such statements, I need to include the ones that I don't want to exclude. Because I used to make those statements without including the ones that have to be in. And he asked me one day, he says, where did you learn that from? I was so ashamed, I nearly cried. He said, because look at Jesus, when he was excluding the son of perdition, he included the ones who will make it. He says, fathers, you see this once, none of them shall be lost. He said, except for the son of perdition. But then I will see things that God is showing me that he wants to do through the hand of the angels of harvest who are separating, who have come to separate the tears from the wheat. And I will talk about the separation of the tears. But then I will not remember, or I did not know at the time because I was but a child, to expressly declare the inclusion of the wheat. I'm, let me say this again. About three years ago it began because the Lord told me that he was about to drive away the multitude. I was happy that I heard his voice as clearly as I did because I saw him, he was in this corner of the room. He walked this way and he says, I am here to drive away the multitude. I was like, this is the Lord. I was delighted. And suddenly he hit me. Oh my gosh, I like the multitude. Because someone in the multitude plays the keyboard in a way that I like. Someone in the multitude can design logos and knows how to put together campaigns online. I like the multitude because someone there has five loaves and two fish. Oh my God, I like the multitude because when the multitude is here, we shut everything down. I like the multitude. But the moment I got over myself, right? The moment I got over myself, you know one of my pastor cousins from Nigeria, he saw the launch of Communion House. He saw the videos and those very first couple of meetings that we did. He was like, oh my God, how I wish I started like you. You guys started from here. And I was like, oh, we thank God for our lives. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. And God was like, huh, indeed. See what I'm about to do. You know, I, I wanted to hold his hand. I wanted to say, well, don't drive away the multitude. He said, but they have come to buy and sell. He says, but my house needs to be a house of prayer. And the Lord brought out the whip. And, you know, it just so happens that the whip was also me. I was also the whip with which he drove out with the multitude. And then we, I would come every now and again and make statements that the Holy Spirit already showed me the outcome of the statement. I will make it, but I wouldn't tell my wife what I know it means and what it will do. Because I wouldn't want to scare anybody. And so when something happens and they're like, oh, these people, this family said they're not coming again. I'm like, oh, maybe we need to give them a call. But in my heart, myself and the Holy Spirit were winking to each other like, yeah, that was what I said the last time. That's what's driving them away. But it's okay simply because 
I must work the work of him who has sent me. My dedication is to the one who sent me. You see, I am committed to the assignment. <laughs> but I am not taking instructions from the ones that I've been sent to. You understand what I mean? Yeah. Because huh, I serve you, but I don't work for you. I work for him, and he sent me to you. And you should be thankful that that is my understanding because that guarantees that I would stay committed. Simply because even when you are not able to sustain me, he will sustain me. You know, because there are certain times wherein the patient cannot sustain the doctor. You understand what I mean? But then the doctor needs to be sustained to see the patient through that difficulty. So what do I do? I keep taking my instructions from the one who sent me. So one of those statements that I made, I'm about to make it again today, but I tell you, you will remain. And this is that statement. I said, God never asks us to do anything that himself hasn't done. And someone is like, oh, I'm being one of those pastors that just wants to sound like something that you can tweet. Now, I'm not saying that so that somebody can go tweet stuff. I don't care. You understand what I mean? By the grace of God, I'm saying it because that is what I am hearing. The Bible says a false witness is an abomination, but the one who hears speaks expressly. And you know what? I say it again today without any fear of compromise because I know what I heard. And I know what you should be hearing. You see, every single thing that God has asked you to do, that he's asking you to do, himself has done it. When he says forgive, he has forgiven. When he says love, he first loved. The Bible says we love him for he first loved us. You understand what I mean? When God is saying, I have put you in a world that is the lowest realm, that is without form and void, that is full of darkness, where darkness doesn't just cover the land, but darkness covers the hearts of men. That is where I have situated you, but I have put you there not to look for more darkness, but to find light. God is like, I am here in heaven, and I am looking to and fro, seeking for good in people. And that's what I want you to do. Not seeking for the fault in people. What you seek is what you find. And so God, in verse 4 of Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, he saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God is calling you and I today to separate light from darkness because you are that light in the firmament that God uses to shine the light upon the earth. And look at verse 18. It says, and you are meant to do what? To divide the light from the darkness. Heaven has come to earth, but most of us are unable to press into it because we cannot see it. There was a heaviness that came upon my heart and I took it before the Lord because at first I was trying to shake it. I was trying to shake the heaviness. Day one, day two, day three, it wasn't working. So after a while I was like, okay, uh, sir, sir, what is going on here? And God was like, man, you must have been having fun. I said, I wasn't having fun. He said, what took you so long? I gave it to you so you can bring it to me. And so I, I took it to him. I said, okay, there it is. So what is this heaviness about? And then it was like, you need to come and stand on this side and see what I see. When I stood on his side and I saw what he saw, I was like, you must be kidding me. He says, no. He said, I'm having a good time. You're the one worried. He who sits in the heavens, the Bible says, laughs. The heaviness came because God wanted me to see the reason why the church, the ecclesia is not marching on. Because we're afraid of stumbling because we are too obsessed with the darkness. He says, so now what do you do? You go back there and tell your brothers and sisters that I want them to see the light. I want them to focus on the light. Do you know how many marriages would make it if spouses can see the light and not the darkness? If my wife had focused on the darkness, she probably would not even have married me. 
But she chose to focus on the light because it is your mission as a believer to separate light from the darkness. And the way to separate light from the darkness is what God did is to first of all see the light. A light that you do not see, you cannot enter. And what you do not enter, you do not possess. And what you do not possess, you don't control. Let me back up one step because you were not with me where I was on Saturday. On Saturday, the Lord took me to a place. A beautiful place. It's a kind of environment that I like. Everything in that environment was natural. It was beautiful, but the steps were cut out of stone. Almost as if they were cut by hand. Everything and the coverings were made of grass and different plants. Lovely place. I was like, man, can we just stay here and, and just build a tabernacle here? This is such a lovely place. And he said to me, I brought you here that you may receive that which I have for you. And as soon as he said that, I went on one knee and he gave to me garments for different dimensions. And so that's why I said, let us back up a moment because what I described to you was the garment of light. You see, I can, I'm everywhere that I go while I'm on this stage, you know, this shirt goes with me. Why? Because I have put it on. And so if you want to control a dimension or an ambience of a dimension, you have to put it on. Because if you don't put it on, you cannot control it and you cannot walk in it. The Bible commands us to walk in love. But how do you walk in love? The Bible says put on Christ. <laughs> because if you do not put on love, you cannot walk in love. I cannot walk in this shirt if I'm not putting it on. And that is the reason why the Lord has sent me to you today to tell you that you need to be able to see the light. Because the Bible says what you see is what you enter. Jesus says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter. So you see first before you enter. So how can I walk in love if I don't see love? How can I see to the multiplication of the good and the magnification of the good that is in other people if I cannot put it on? I have to be able to see it. I have to be able to see the light simply because darkness is very present in everybody. There are times where I want to correct my children because I see what they're doing that could hurt them. I want to correct them. And sometimes rather than just speaking the truth, you speak fire. You know, on multiple occasions, my wife would call me and say to me, I get what you're trying to tell Joshua. But you see all that shouting? is getting in the way of what you're saying. You understand what I mean? Because there are times wherein the darkness of my flesh comes along when I am trying to go shine the light. And that is when I'm like, I'm yelling, not because the Spirit needs to yell. The Bible says the Holy Spirit speaks in a still, small voice. A lot of that yelling is just the flesh. Let's be honest. You understand what I mean? Let the, let the soundness of the truth that you're communicating speak louder than the volume that your emotions can provide. But guess what? It is the way we are. And let me say this to you. This is the part of it or one of the things that hit me the most when the Lord was giving me this lecture. He said to me, I was intentional about bringing this analogy from the sun and the moon. He says, you know why? He said, I think I know why. Because sometimes the moment God asks you, the answer is there. I said, because the sun rises every day. He says, yeah. He said, because you need to do this every day. Every single day we wrestle the darkness. But every single day, we have an opportunity to see the light. Don't get tired of seeing the light. If you can be committed to seeing the light in people every single day, you will be able to separate the darkness every single day. It is your mandate by God. And so why is all of these things, why is it happening? Matthew chapter 12 verse 7. Actually, let's, let's stop along the way. Micah chapter 4, verse 19. I just kind of like 104, 13. Micah chapter 4, sorry, verse 9. 
Micah 4 verse 9, it says, Now, why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? And has your counselor perished? For pangs have seized you like a woman in labor. What did I just tell you about us and the truth? The truth does not need to be screamed. Because kings don't have to shout. The Bible says wherever the word of a king is, there is power. And he says, why do you cry aloud? Why are you yelling because you want to correct a child? The moment you notice the yelling, separate the yelling from the words because the king in you does not yell. He only speaks because his words already are powerful enough. <laughs> it's one of the strategies for separating light from darkness. The king is light. The light is king. And that was why the Bible says, if the light in you be darkness, how deep is that darkness? So what is supposed to be in you? Your king. And what is supposed to be in you? The light. So that means the king is light. Because Jesus is the king and he is light. And you are kings because you are light. That's what makes him the king of kings. Well, it doesn't make him the king of kings. It makes you a king because he is already king of kings. So that's why there's a place for you to be king. The Bible says, why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst, inside of you? Do you not have a king? Has your counselor perished? Who is your counselor? The Holy Spirit. The word perish there means, have you been separated from life? Have you been separated from the ministry of the Holy Spirit who speaks in a still, small voice? Husbands, stop yelling at your wives. Wives, stop yelling at your husbands. Speak to them as royalty to royalty, the word of life. Let us learn to separate the darkness from the light. When you look at people and you observe them, find the light. Because the moment you see darkness is indicative of the fact that light must be somewhere. Jesus said it's 50-50, 12 hours in the day, 12 hours in the night. You know what this is supposed to do? Anyway, I was going to Matthew chapter 12 or 7, but I thought I'll, I'll show you a scripture by the grace of God and by the Holy Spirit to go with this notion of learning to demote you. The Bible says some of us, we cry over things as though we're in labor pains. Your emotions have to be put under check. I used to be a yeller. Like I told you the story before, and one day my wife yelled back at me, and I cried like a baby to my daddy. I went to my dad. No, I literally called my father. And I'm like, no, I'm done with this. I can't take this anymore. And my dad was like, what happened this time? I said, can you believe Rosemary? She's yelling at me. And my father was like, ah, maybe, 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 just maybe she learned from you. When he said that, I was so humbled. I couldn't even accept that I was humbled. I still yelled a little bit. It was after I got off the phone that, and I read his text message like 14 times before I started to calm down. You see, because kind begets kind. The Bible says whoever sows the wind will reap the whirlwind. Many of us complain about the way that our spouses behave, whereas you started it. You are reaping what you sowed. Uh, it's the hard truth. Tonight is for, yeah, there's not a lot of clapping tonight and it's okay. Yeah, praise the Lord. People were clapping initially until I said I was kicked out of certain places. And they were like, oh, we don't want to be kicked out of our jobs. That's, that's all you. So we, we, we're just going to be keeping it to John 3, 16. Thank you. And nobody talking about no light shining in the sky. You understand what I mean? But at the end of the day, someone's got to do it. So I, I take one for the team. Or maybe I've taken two already, actually. So the Bible says, for pangs, I've seized you like a woman in labor. Do you know that... Uh, the Yoruba people have an expression that the ones who have given birth to children are still awaiting gifts and now you're giving birth to anger. What do you get? You're, you're way back in the line. And what happens is they have this understanding that the way some people are so committed to delivering and expressing their frustration and anger is the way a woman is committed to giving birth to that child. 
And they're like, there is more things that you can give birth to rather than emotions that are negative. Many of us, we're so committed to letting people know how angry we are. You want to push out that anger like a woman in labor. But you can push out virtue. You can push out forgiveness. You can push out love. Many of us, we're so angry at other people's failure and lack of discretion that we just want the ground to open up and swallow them. But the reality of it is that some people, they're not even aware of their own darkness. God is allowing you to see it so that you can look beyond the darkness into the light so that you can help to separate the darkness from the light. That is what you do because you are light. You are the apple of his eyes. You are the apple of literally his eyes, the firmament. Holy Ghost. When I said his eyes, the firmament, I saw tears. And he says the eyes are truly the firmament separating the waters from the waters. Let him who has an ear hear what has just been said. Matthew chapter 12 verse 7. And we're going to land this plane. But I'm so happy today because I think this, the clock stopped. Because I, I feel like I've been able to say quite a bit today and it's still just 8.08 .08 central. Say that again. No, no, no. If, 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 if our Pacific time is even better, right? Or mountain time. And we're mountain men because the Bible says that we are from Zion. Yeah. So this is what? In mountain time, is it like what? Six o'clock? Hallelujah. No, it's seven o'clock, I think. Mountain time. Seven o'clock. That is awesome. Seven, the number of perfection. So welcome to mountain time, everybody. Yeah. God is good. Look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 7. And Patricia is not here today, so I'm good to go. The Bible says, but if you had known what it means that I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Ha! Full circle. When the Lord invited me to this meeting, one of the things that I got out of it, I mean, when, when, the, when it was all done, because this, this particular message in particular, the Lord took me through it. You see, it wasn't like I was premeditating what I would say, but I needed to go through it for reasons that I've already expressed and some that you're about to see or some that you will see when you listen to it again. In case you missed it, one of the reasons why the Lord allowed me to go through it is because he wanted me to be able to speak to certain things with a particular measure of boldness so that you can glean from that confidence. And so when he brought me to this part, I was so delighted because I'm like, okay, now this makes sense. Because when he said to me, come and stand next to me, and he showed me what he saw, he said, you see, you're the only one that is getting agitated. I, what I am seeing is light. And that is the reason why he's beaming with a smile. And he said to me, he says, I've already brought heaven. He said, but most people cannot see it because they're too obsessed with the darkness. He says, heaven is already here. But people are waiting for it to come. How many times will it come? It's already here. But to see it is to see the light. You have to see the light because it is light. He says, once you then see it, then you can begin to walk in it. The, the body of Christ is not in as desperate a situation as we think it is. But the reason why we think it is, is because we're looking at people and we keep seeing their shortcomings and their failures. We keep seeing the darkness in them instead of seeing the light. And that is the reason why we cannot be at rest. And the Lord is saying to us, if you will move with me in these last days, especially as it begins to rain, because we have come to the days of Noah once again. And the Lord says to me, if you will be with me, then you have to be with me. What does it mean to be with the Lord? Jesus says, let us go to the other side. And after he said that, he went to sleep. In the midst of the storm, 
he was sleeping. Where were the disciples? The disciples were not with Jesus, even though Jesus was with them. So don't get it twisted. God doesn't leave you. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But you can leave him. And how, how does that work? God is with you, never leaves you, nor forsakes you. But you can leave him, but every time you leave him, you're only separating your consciousness from life unto death. But your instance of existence, which is your spirit, never leaves God. So basically, you create an alter ego that embodies your consciousness. And that is how darkness is able to punish you. You worry even though you're in the midst of plenty. You're afraid even though you are under his wings. Because the you that is with him is your spirit and it never leaves. You can allow your consciousness to enjoy that peace as well. So Jesus was with the disciples on the boat, but they were not with him. They were on the deck. Why were they on the deck? They wanted to keep observing what was going on. They were walking by sight instead of walking by faith. The ones who walk by faith, they lay next to the king of their heart in the stern of the boat. The ones who walk by sight are worrying. And that is the reason why they saw the storm. You see things that are supposed to be invisible. Because fear is false evidences appearing real. Jesus said, let us go to the other side. But they were not with him. What was he doing? What's the technical term for what Jesus was doing? Does anybody know? It's a four-letter word. He was, he was at rest. That is the technical term for what he was doing. He was at rest. So to be with God, especially in these last days, where are you supposed to be? At rest. Because... He says that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. And what is the meaning of Noah? Noah means the Lord's rest. So if you are going to be with the Lord and see what he sees, if you are going to see heaven before the end comes, and if you are going to be able to embody the light and be in control of the light, being able to take the light with you everywhere you go to because you have embodied the light, you have to be at rest. And you cannot be at rest when you're frustrated at every little thing every little person does. You can only be at rest when you see what God is doing through them. Because that's what allows you to forgive them and begin to minister healing to them. And look at what the Bible says here. The Bible says here, the Bible says that if you have known what it means that I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you will not have condemned the guiltless. So rather than condemning the guiltless, the Bible says focus on the light and show mercy. Focus on mercy. Focus on light. Focus on mercy. Focus on light. Don't focus on judgment and condemnation, which is darkness. Focus on light. The Bible says when you do those things, what does it say in verse 8? For the Son of Man is the Lord of your rest. That is how you come to be with the Lord of rest himself. God wants to give you rest in this season. You know what? Because... If you do not have his rest, you will be swept away. If you do not have his rest, you cannot receive. Because God brings his blessings only to those who are at peace, who are still. When people were hungry at Jesus' conference, they were moving back and forth. Everybody was looking for food. Jesus told his disciples, tell them to sit down. Every single one of them. Because if they're not sitting down, nobody gets any food. Nobody passing around got a sandwich on the day. Come and read your Bible. The Bible says the first thing that Jesus did was he caused his disciples to sit them in 50s. And the reason why is 50, did I tell you that before? I must have told you because 50 is the product of 5 and 10. 10 is the number of tests. 5 is the number of grace. When we are being tested, will you choose grace or will you choose condemnation? God wants you to be at rest. To be at rest is to recognize that you're being tested. And when you're being tested, you show grace. When... Let me not use my voice as an example because I'm always kind of like the bad guy. 
Yeah, because I was going to say, when, when God is testing me with my wife, and I'm, I couldn't think of anything. So let me use me as an example. When the Lord is testing my wife's patience with a lot of, well, with some of my ex eccentricities. You know one of my eccentricities that is a pet peeve of my wife's is that no matter what it is, I am hardly ever in a hurry. You probably don't know that about me. <laughs> you can set off a fire alarm. You could say there is fire on the mountain and that will be as calm as a cucumber. You know that expression, is it calm as a cucumber? It's cool, yeah, cool and calm. Thank you, Alan. Your wife is not here, but you're still being a teacher. I can see your words. I will be as cool and as calm as a cucumber. And everyone is like, oh, don't you see the time? I'm like, no, I see the Lord. And when my wife is getting tested, you know what? Initially, she used to go to judgment. She used to then say things like, oh, you make us late all the time, this and that, this and that. But after a while, she has learned to go to grace. So she'll come and say, so what else do you need? Do you need me to help you button that shirt? So I, I can help you choose which one of these shoes they're the same, but I'm going to help you choose. Why don't you put on the left one first and then the right one? You see, because that is how we get to be at peace when we choose grace when we are being tested. Every single one of us is being tested, and God is using our brothers and sisters, the ones who are closest to us, to test us. The Bible says a man's enemies are those of his household. And that is the reason why you look at us in the body of Christ, and we have been hurting each other since Jesus went to Calvary. But it's okay, because God knows that nothing will juice grace out of you as much as when you are being tested. So what do you do? Go to rest. Rest in him, because he is the Lord of the Sabbath. We're going to do just one more thing before we break bread. And the word is to be assertive. We need to be very what? Assertive. Because the danger to this assignment and commission is what appears to be the gray areas between the light and the dark. There isn't, but there is an appearance. And then, if you are not being assertive and you do not choose to give credence to the light, Satan will get you stuck in the gray area and you will find every justification to choose punishment instead of mercy. So how do you do that? Let me tell you four things. Thing number one is this. The Bible says Christ in you the hope of glory. Whenever you encounter anyone in the body of Christ, first of all, believe that they are saved and believe that they are of God and reborn according to the similitude of Christ because the Bible says, whosoever is born of God is of God and does not sin. So the first thing you do when you encounter a challenge, when someone else is involved, a believer, what you do is first of all, find Christ in them. Open the journals of your mind and find Christ in them. Find that one time that they said something that was life. Find that one time that they did something that was faithful. Find it. Because if you're not intent on finding it, you will conclude that it does not exist. That is thing number one. You need to find the light in them. And then you need to say something good. The Bible says God saw the light. And he saw that it was good. In verse 4, you don't see it explicitly. But when you look at when God was done with creation, what did the Bible say? The Bible says, and God saw all of the work of his hand, all of the work that he had done, all. I want you to remember the word all. He saw all that he had done and he says, it is good. And I'm like, but the Bible says that the serpent was in the garden. So when God saw all that he did and he said that it was good, that includes the mosquito. That includes everything that you wish would, it includes spiders. My wife said, yes, it includes spiders. 
My brother nearly got stung, bitten by a spider two days ago on site. He was on site on one of our sites in Nigeria, and the spider was about the size of my palm. Yeah, I, I said that spider was from Jericho. Not a spider, a scorpion, rather. Sorry, a scorpion. Massive scorpion. But guess what? The Lord revealed it before it was able to perform his mission. What was I saying about that again? The scorpion was there. The serpent was there. Because, you know, the serpent did not come into the garden to tempt Eve. You know, the Bible says that the serpent was already in the garden and it was the most cunning of all of God's creation. So the serpent was not an accident. It was God's creation. It was serving its purpose. Okay, so don't be obsessing over Satan and be obsessing over bad people. They're serving a purpose. Obsess over the light. So what do you do? See the light and say something. The Bible says God said that it was good. So you need to say something good about your brother, about your sister. Say something good about that situation. Because if you don't, something evil will come out of your mouth. Why? The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So your heart is constantly absorbing by diffusion all of what's around you, or by osmosis rather, your heart is constantly absorbing. So if you don't get ahead of it by being assertive and seeing, recognizing the light and speaking to the light, guess what happens? The darkness will come out of you and you're going to say, I'm tired of this already. This is not working. I hate this. Where's that coming from? The overflow of your heart. So how do you get ahead of that? By stepping forward and telling your heart, we choose light today. And number three thing is what I said already. Be ready to do it again tomorrow. Because some of us, we forgive people one day and when they come back the next day, you're like, I can't keep encouraging this foolishness. If I don't put my foot down today, they're going to keep doing it. But what side are you putting that foot? In the dark or in the light? Put that foot in the light and you watch the darkness get separated and put in its place until the end. Just like God did. The Bible says the light he called day and the darkness he called night. Capital N. And Jesus says that night is coming, but it's not here now. Because when the Father separated it, he separated it so far away. But you and I have to do it every day. So what do you do? Be ready to do it again. And thing number four, to ensure that you are constantly separating the light from the darkness. I beg of you in the mighty name of Jesus to not receive this as a cliche, but receive it as an instruction from the heart of your heavenly father, and that is to put on love. When people try to put offense on you, shake it off and put on love. Because if you are not robed in love, you will move around and soil everywhere with offense. You will soil and spoil everything with condemnation, with, with, with all kinds of, of accusations. When you can put on love and just recognize that every single one of us needs love, needs forgiveness, needs help, and needs to be seen for what we truly are in Christ Jesus, which is light instead of the darkness that we are in the flesh. Praise the Lord. God is good. And when all of this is done, the will of the Father will be done on earth, which is the Father will be standing with all of his children, standing on his side, seeing from his perspective what he sees, and that is only, and only then would we be ready as an army of saints to plunge into the darkness and drive it into outer oblivion forever. You know, the Bible says that he's coming with tens, tens of thousands of his saints. That is the picture. You are those saints, but you are only saints when you are coming from where he is coming from, when you are seeing from his perspective, when you are charging from his perspective, not when you are standing opposite your heavenly father as an accuser of the brethren. No, he want, Jesus is not making his appearance just yet because he's still waiting for some saints to get in line, to come from the, size of, the side of judging everybody and seeing the evil in everybody and not being able to love and forgive, not being able to recognize the good that people are trying to do because there is good in us. 
It's just that sometimes the weight of our wickedness and darkness overshadows the good. But guess what? Those who focus on the light will change the dynamics, reverse the curse, and bring out the light. And all of us can stand together on the same side as saints of the Most High, saved not by our own goodness, but saved by grace. Ah, very good. I remember. Jeremiah eleven thirteen, And then we're going to break bread with that verse of scripture. Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 13. I want you to say to yourself, my emotions will not pressure me into delivering negative babies. I am not under the pressure to give birth to judgment. But I choose to be on the side of the king that is inside of me. The light, the love, the faithfulness, the joy. Micah chapter 4 verse 9. Now Jeremiah chapter 11 verse 13, very real quick. Read it with an open heart. You see, because, anyway, let's, let's just read it. The Bible says, for according to the number of your cities, Jeremiah chapter 11 verse 13. Oh, no, no, sorry, 11 verse 19. Yeah, but let's read verse 13 uh, since we started. The Bible says, for according to the number of your cities were your gods, O Judah, and according to the number of your streets, of the streets of Jerusalem, you have set up altars to that shameful thing, altars to burn incense, to bow. Now, let's read verse 19. But I was like a docile lamb brought to the slaughter, and I did not know what they had devised. I did not know that they had devised schemes against me, saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be remembered no more. They want to cut down the tree and its fruits. They don't want his name to be remembered anymore. Jesus said, as they did to me, so shall they do to you. So at the beginning or somewhere along the line, I told you, I said, look, I know the feeling in the room of fear because the reality of it is that these people, are, they see us. And when I say these people, I'm talking about the agents that Satan is using to make this life miserable, to make this realm continually bow to darkness. He is using them to enslave us to keep us from truly living as the light that we are. And the Bible says that we are led as sheep to the slaughter all day. But look at what we are to be, what we are supposed to see here is that we are being led to the slaughter, not because of us, but because of the vine. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And it is the glory of God that the name of the anointed one and his anointing be praised all through the land. The entire earth is supposed to shout Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. But the darkness wants to eradicate the name of Jesus. And that is the reason why they're coming after us. But guess what? Knowing this allows for us to be confident that at the end of the day, I'm not the one they're looking for. It is Jesus. Let me explain that for a quick minute and then we're going to break bread. Because it is very important to God for your heart to be at peace. When Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss, the moment he agreed, the Bible says a regiment of the army of the temple was given to him to go and bring Jesus. But when Peter saw the army, he became afraid. He thought that was his battle to fight. He drew the sword and he chopped off the ear of one of the soldiers. What is the implication of what he did? Many of us, because we took, we take these things personal. We think the darkness is after us. We chop off the ear of the same people we're supposed to preach the gospel to. And that is the reason why they cannot hear us because our emotions have gone ahead of our message. We get agitated because Josephine came and she didn't say hello to you. The reason why Satan is magnifying that to you is because Satan wants you to think that everything is against you. Satan and the darkness don't care a thing about you. They are coming for Jesus. They are coming for the fruit because they want to stop the tree. You just read it. 
We have been slaughtered because we are seen as the fruits of him who is called the vine. So that they can eliminate his name from the earth. His name is peace. Satan wants to eliminate peace from the earth. So stop taking things personal. It, they are not coming for you. They are coming for Jesus. And Jesus is very able to handle himself. So what do you do? Hold your peace. Be at rest. Do you know the moment you recognize that? It's difficult for people to annoy you. Because when they are coming, you're like, okay, they, 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 they're coming for Jesus. They want to try the Jesus that is in me. It's okay. The Jesus in me is the king, and he can handle the storm. So rather than me getting ferocious like an animal, reacting out of emotions like an unbeliever, guess what I do? I'm at peace. And I'm like, wow, praise God. God is good. And then I wait for Jesus to respond. And if we can always wait for Jesus to respond, hmm, there will be peace. Because when he responded to the storm, what did he say? He didn't say, storm, how dare you threaten my disciples? Look at Peter, he's peed on himself. Just because you were... Jesus is not accused the storm for not having discretion. Jesus is not saying, did, did you not know that I was the one who told them we'll go to the other side? How dare you come? No, Jesus just said to the storm, peace. And the Bible says a soft answer turns away turbulence, turns away wrath. And so the, even the storm was like, okay. You're not going to make trouble. Jesus was like, no, I make peace. Be peacemakers. And you shall see God. Let us receive the Lord's body and, and his blood in remembrance of him. And today I just want you to say, Lord, I, I choose to remember to let you have your way. I choose to remember that you are the vine and I'm just one of your branches. I choose to remember that the darkness is coming for you. And so I, I choose not to take it personal, but to surrender to you and to let you speak through me, to let you handle the situation. I choose to remember that you are the king of my heart. I choose to remember that there is a king in the midst of us. I choose to remember. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in Jesus' name. You know, there is a king in Zion, and he is called the Prince of Peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you. May it rest mightily upon you. May you hear the word of the Lord Jesus speaking to every situation that troubles you, so that rather than worrying and fretting, you choose to be at peace. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation. It is the joy of the whole earth and it is called Mount Zion, the city of the great king. The king is in your midst. Praise the Lord. God bless you, Alan. Let's celebrate the Lord again for this night. Hallelujah. We're going to go ahead and press in in our giving. Amen. God is good. Let's keep giving in faith. This fertile ground, I keep reminding us because there's so much to be thankful for in this season. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you'll see the giving details there on the screen to our family online, Cash App, Dollar Sign, Communion House, PayPal at Communion House, as well as the Zelle, and online giving information there. If you need an envelope, our brother Kenyatta has that available. Amen. God is good. So with our offerings prepared, we'll go ahead and lift that up. Father, we give you praise for this hour, this season, O oh God, of equipping how you have blessed us, O oh God, how you have kept us. Lord, we thank you for the divine enablement that we have received, O oh God, on tonight to 
see the light, to separate light from darkness, oh God, to see the good, that good that can only come from you, oh God, that we may be effective in what you have called us to do, being the light in those that you have called to our circle of influence. Lord, let these offerings unto you, this seed that you have granted unto us, O God, for truly seed comes from you. You give it to the sower. Let it be found pleasing unto you and let it be multiplied in this house. O God, as we continue to sow under obedience, under your instruction, O God, knowing that it is you and you alone that brings increase. Let us be rejuvenated in that tonight. We declare that all glory belong to you. And we all said, amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the name of the Lord. God is good. What a night tonight. Another message we need to tap into several times. Let it get deep down. Uh, again, we'll be praying tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Instagram Live. Please tap into that. We have the Zoom link as well. And men, we have shared this a couple times in the chat. Don't forget, conference, not this Saturday, but next Saturday. If you don't have the details for that just yet, I can give that to you personally tonight. Just come find me, all righty? Everyone have a blessed night.